Thank you all for, <clears throat> for, for the generous introduction. And thank you for welcoming me here. Because I usually dwell on the other end of campus, so I feel like I'm, you know, on foreign ground when I come over here. <clears throat> One thing I should say at the outset is that uh, in working in this paper, working on the paper and, and uh, giving it the title that I did, I found that in some ways um, the question evolved as I worked on it, and so I hope you won't feel that I'm um, engaging in an act of, uh, of a disgraceful misrepresentation, um, because I think you'll see as, as I get into the paper that in some respects it's more, um, I talk a little bit more about how these objects ended up in museums than the why, although I touch a little bit on the why, but uh, you'll, you'll see as, as I get on into it. And um, also, just to let you know, the paper's probably about a half hour long, so there'll be plenty of time for questions and, and, uh, <clears throat> and comments, and I hope that you'll bombard me with comments. Um, I'm kind of at a uh, tender point right now. I need to move things and you know, figure out what's working and what isn't. Uh, so, um, beginning in the, in the 19... Start here. Beginning in the 1950s, by the way, let me know if you can't hear me. <clears throat> Give me a hand signal or something. Beginning in the 1950s, the Jewish Museum of New York, which has one of the world's largest collections of Jewish ceremonial objects, launched a two decade long series of daring avant garde exhibitions. They're fascinating for many reasons, chief among which is the most celebrated of them featured works by non Jews such as Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg, works that were devoid of Jewish subject matter as well. The Jewish Museum is associated with the Jewish Theological Seminary, the principal training ground for rabbis in the conservative branch of American Judaism, adding yet another dimension to this novel intersection of religious and art world cultures. The story raises a number of questions, first among which is, why did Jews sponsor exhibitions of avant-garde art by non-Jews? Answering that question, however, leads back in time into other questions, including the one that titles this paper. The tale begins long before the creation of what became the Jewish Museum in 1904. Indeed, it begins well before the concept of museums had arisen within the intellectual and social lives of the Jewish people. As a religious and ethnic community, the Jews possessed neither the need nor the institutional models that would have inspired them to create museums. Further, with the exception of the ancient Museum of Alexandria, which was founded in 280 BCE, from classical antiquity until the 17th century, Museums were usually private rather than public and established by individuals rather than communities. The revival of the museum idea during the Renaissance was pursued by separate scholars, merchants, aristocrats, monarchs, and a few Christian clerics who possessed either the wealth or patronage to collect objects of all kinds, ranging from foreign naturalia imported by European explorers to luxury objects fashioned by skilled artisans. <clears throat> Only by the late 17th century did museums created by individuals begin evolving into public institutions along the lines we think of today, entities that offered access to more than a handful of the founders' friends or subjects. Museums began to be established by government and non-governmental communities early in the 19th century many in the wake of the Louvre's creation during the French Revolution. Created with the art collections of the monarch and works confiscated from the church and aristocracy, the Louvre was born as a symbol of, the, of France's egalitarian republic and its citizen sovereignty, displacing that of the king. The art now belonged to the public, and the Louvre's doors were thrown open to everyone. The Louvre, more than any other institution, transformed the museum idea into a civic monument that symbolized for people throughout Europe the locus of a people's patrimony and their free access to it. <clears throat> With the exception of the Hofjuden, or court Jews, 
Few members of the Jewish community possess the income or access to collect objects at the same level as their non-Jewish contemporaries. Of the very few Hofjuden who collected precious things, none of them created museum-like settings such as Kunstkammern, Kunstkammern or cabinets of curiosity that it would, have, it would have been appropriate to the time. Further, although the Jews com comprised for some a, quote, abstract nation, it was one that spanned continents and transcended the boundaries of secular political divisions. On the other hand, as a religious and ethnic community, the Jews certainly possessed a coherent identity that had long found expression in material objects. However, they did not possess the degree of ethnic or historical consciousness, a kind of distancing from their own traditions that would have led them to perceive their objects, particularly their ceremonial objects, as anything other than the necessary accoutrements of religious rituals and sacred observances. Yet that particular kind of consciousness would be an essential precondition for Jews to enter into the process of deracination, that is, a shift within the Jewish community from regarding ceremonial objects as existing solely for the purposes of religious observances to an understanding of those objects as visual evidence, as works that ought to be displayed for others to see. There were two changes that had to occur, both of which resulted from the Jewish people's confrontation with modernity. One was triggered by the Enlightenment and the gradual absorption of its tenets by a number of influential Jewish thinkers, particularly in Germany, beginning with Moses Mendelssohn. The other change was emancipation, starting in France in the 1790s and spreading by fits and starts, most conspicuously in Germany. Together, these shifts altered Jewish understandings of their community and of Judaism. A seminal moment was Napoleon's convening of a Sanhedrin in 1807 of Jewish leaders to address a series of questions regarding the Jews' roles and responsibilities within the French Republic. Their answers were buttressed by the leaders' assurance that the Jews did not form a nation within France, but rather a community of co-religionists who were also loyal citizens of the French Republic. As one of Napoleon's commissioners commented at the time, quote, the Jews ceased to be a people and remained only a religion. The transformation was not quite that simple, however. Before Jews received the rights of citizenship, one scholar observed, Judaism was not a religion, and Jewishness was not a matter of culture or nationality. Because Judaism in its pre-modern form was both a closed world and an integrated totality, it was all but impossible for the average Jew to imagine a state of religious being that could be disaggregated into a public and private, uh, into public and private spheres. With emancipation, it became possible for Jews to live in public as, for example, German citizens, and in private as observant Jews. Yet paradoxically, the social opportunities that accompany participation in the public institutions and civic arenas of the nation state heightened the Jewish community's awareness of the foreignness of its religious rituals to the, to the surrounding Gentile society. The distillation of Judaism into a religion, that is, as an aspect of Jewish life that can coexist with other religions within the ideological as well as temporal boundaries of the modern state, required far more than emancipation. It necess necessitated a rethinking of, Jew of Judaism by Jewish scholars. Oops. What I'm showing, by the way, are various Jewish ceremonial objects, uh, which I'll sh of which I'll show a few more before we get into the exhibitions. That rethinking that I just referenced was led by a group of Jewish intellectuals in Germany who drew together in the 1820s to form a loosely organized scholarly society and journal. <clears throat> they came to be known collectively by that publication, the Zeitschrift für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, or the Journal for the Science of Judaism. As a school of thought, the Wissenschaft des Judentums 
re represented the advent of a new kind of historical consciousness within Judaism. New because it drew on but separated itself from an um, unbroken lineage of rabbinic learning that began in antiquity after the Second Temple's destruction in 70 CE and the preservation, interpretation, and transmission of religious texts and oral traditions. Clearly, subsequent generations of rabbis possessed a sense of the Jewish people's history. Yet rabbinic scholarship sustained a style of textual analysis that remained intrinsically and flagrantly ahistorical. The characteristic of the Wissenschaft des Judentums that would differentiate it from previous Jewish learning was its position outside that rabbinic tradition, approaching it with the discerning but cold eye of the scientist. Wissenschaft scholars dispassionately studied Judaism and its texts with the tools of comparative history and uh, literary analysis, drawing on texts and methods that came from outside the world of rabbinic tradition. Thus, Rabbi Bar Fossil study, uh, analyzed Jewish civil law by comparing it with the structure of Austrian civil law. In the process, Fossil realized, and I'm quoting, I studied Talmud before I occupied myself with the law codes of the modern period. And I know that rabbinic law became clear to me only by way of the latter. The authors of rabbinic law lacked the technical terms to make the various nuances, gradations, and differences clear and distinct. Scholars attributed the formation of the Wissenschaft des Judentums to many causes, as well as opportunities associated with emancipation. One was advocating the Jews' legitimacy to secure the fruits of emancipation alongside other citizens of the emerging nation-states of Europe. Another was modernizing Judaism in keeping with the Jewish people's new status, the various modernizing schemes leading to the formation directly of reform, conservative, orthodox, and ultra-orthodox denominations in Europe and America. Regardless of the purposes that impelled the Wissenschaft des Judentums forward, underlying them was a degree of alienation from rabbinic learning that, that, that uh, in turn increased self-knowledge. To make Judaism comprehensible to the non-Jew required much more than a literal translation of ancient texts. The texts and institutions, the value system and thought patterns of Judaism had to be expounded and mediated in conceptual terms indigenous to the intellectual world of the West. And it was precisely this activity of conceptual translation which in turn illuminated many a facet of Judaism and to which the Jewish insider up to, up to now had been utterly oblivious. Scholars who dismiss these expositions as apologetics, written merely with a view to advancing the cause of emancipation, obscure the insight that comes with distance. The task of explaining Judaism to Christians demanded that the Wissenschaft des Judentums not only situate itself within the intellectual context of Western learning, but also dispel the myths and half-truths of generations of Christian scholarship, much of which was motivated by anti-Semitism. The Wissenschaft uh, leader, Leopold Sons, noticed an extensive exhibition on the history of printing that was presented in Berlin in 1840 that neglected to include any Hebrew printed books. He linked the omission to an anti-Semitic incident in the Middle East commenting, quote, if the law of the outsider applies to us in Damascus, it applies no less in the celebration of the printed book. One remembers mendacious accusations, but not illustrious achievements. The Jews are self-evidently excluded from the homage lavished on the first printers. And I should mention here that among the first printers were Jews. In his complaint, Zunz fingered two new possibilities for the heirs of the Wissenschaft des Judentums. First was the pursuit of Jewish studies as both an act of justice as well as self-interest. Second was the public representation of Jewish history in exhibitions, not just as a problem, but also as an opportunity. Although the Jews had no history of exhibiting Judaica, 
much less creating museums or systematic collections of Judaica prior to the 19th century. Once the intellectual and economic effects of the Enlightenment and emancipation began to be felt, things rapidly changed. As Jews acquired both the wealth to assemble collections and a consciousness of Judaism that enabled them to perceive Judaica as religious, historical, or cultural evidence rather than ceremonial objects, the steps to mounting exhibitions and founding museums could readily be taken. At this point, however, it's important to note that the Jews were ill-prepared to present Judaic in public settings. They lacked prior traditions of communal collecting and display, and the scholarly advances of the Wissenschaftsjudentums offered no guidance. The options emerging outside the Jewish community, among the museums, collecting activities, and expositions of Europe, were shaped by the interests of scholarly disciplines and in, in, in international commerce. How, given these many options, ought the Jews present their ceremonial objects to Gentiles as well as other Jews? Were the objects ethnographic evidence of a living religion or historical evidence of vanishing traditions? Should they be treated as works of art or visual aids for displays on Jewish ritual? How might the Jews' preferred audiences shape the institutions and displays they wanted to organize? Would exhibitions mounted for non-Jews be the same as those intended for the Jewish community? Further, while the sociocultural processes that enabled Jews to contemplate collecting and publicly displaying Judaica were in place by the late 19th century, the decisions of Jews to do so were nonetheless remarkable. Within a comparatively short period of time, and without evidence of any intracommunal disputes, Jews began to deracinate their ritual objects, in many instances for the express purposes of public display. There is a debate to be had about the novelty, the novelty of this transition within Western civilization, but the change is intriguing for the insights it affords regarding a, formally, a formerly closed culture's decisions to display itself to others. Sadly, within the history of exhibitions and museums, the best-known examples of deracination are those in which the uprooting of objects were at best only partially voluntarily, uh, only partially voluntary, and usually forced. Cultures of origin, usually in Africa or the Americas, had no say about how their objects might be presented in European museums, and by the end of the 19th century, the alternatives were determined by established or emerging scholarly disciplines, as well as the cultural myths and social objectives of European civilization. To understand a few of the exhibition alternatives that Jews, as residents on the margins of European society, might have contemplated, one can turn to the many examples of cultures that experienced the forced deracination of their treasures. Starting at least as early as the Renaissance, there is evidence of settings in which the valued objects of Europe's others were collected and displayed. Those objects, which voyages of discovery and colonization brought to Europe's shores, were initially presented as curiosities, trophies of conquest, or subjects of well-intended, if misguided, inquiry. By the end of the 19th century, knowledge of the cultures of origin advanced to the point that works uprooted from Africa, East Asia, and the Americas could be presented in exhibits or dioramas that conveyed some sense, even if very limited, of the settings in which those objects were created and used. For the most part, however, outmoded taxonomic systems based on typologies of form rather than use continue to prevail. Taken together, these exhibit alternatives continued uh, constitute a poetics of display that reveals how different exhibit methods can affect how we perceive objects. An innovative 1988 exhibition titled Art Artifact that was presented at the Center of African Art in New York vividly explored the poetics of display. It also illustrated some of the alternatives that would have been available and perhaps known to Jews organizing exhibitions in the last few decades of the 19th century. The objects presented in Art, Artif Art Artifact were freestanding posts created to honor ancestors by the members of the Mijikenda 
a constellation of nine tribes who dwelled uh, at one time along the coast of, uh, of Kenya. In the exhibition, they are shown in a number of ways. Four are particularly relevant to this discussion. The first is in the manner of a cabinet of curiosity, where the post is casually set in the corner of the room, furnished with a variety of more or less related objects. And um, it's right, you can see it's right here. There is no sense of an organizing principle at work, and the overall effect is closer to a trophy room than a museum. Next is a typological display that appears, where works appear, that appear to be at least superficially similar are presented in the same space. Here there is an organizing principle. It's one of facilitating ethnographic or aesthetic comparisons of like objects as a means of building knowledge and the capacity to discern differences in meaning and craftsmanship. The third is an ethnographic installation that presents a solitary Mijikenda post alongside other culturally related objects. It's a step toward it's a step towards contextualization based on the assumption that related works, though formally different, will yield an understanding greater than the sum of the parts. Last is a natural history museum style diorama that shows, ostensibly from a Mijikenda tribesman's perspective, how a memorial post's actual use in its place of origin might be presented. For reasons that warrant further study, when Jews began to exhibit ceremonial objects, they relied primarily on just one of these alternatives. The earliest documented exhibitions of Judaica occurred within less than two decades of each other, between 1878 and the late, 18, uh, the late 1890s. All were inspired by the possibilities of the large exposition vividly demonstrated by the famous inaugural endeavor, the great exhibition of the works of industry in all nations. Also known as the Crystal Palace Exhibition, it was presented near London in 1851 and hosted 13,000 exhibitions, or 13,000 exhibits and installations, and six million visitors during its six-month run. The first Judaica exhibit was mounted in Paris 27 years later, in 1878, as part of the Exposition Universelle uh, that was for the arts, industry, and agriculture. Uh, and the uh, exhibition site was both this very large complex on the left, as well as this building that was created on the right the Palais du Trocadero, which was created, both were created especially for the exposition. The, uh, the Paris exposition was much larger than the Crystal Palace exhibition and hosted even more visitors. The Judaica display was presented in the Palais du Trocadero and consisted of selections from the collection of one individual, Isaac Strauss, an Alsatian Jew by then living in Paris. No installation photographs survive, but a catalog in introducing the exhibit and containing individual item descriptions, all numbered in sequence, conveys some hints about the display's organization. <coughs> there are 82 items in the exhibit, including a handful of manuscripts and books. The display appears to have been arranged primarily by the object's uses in Jewish synagogue and home rituals, and then within each grouping, typologically, with like items being placed together. These spice boxes, used in a ceremony to mark the conclusion of the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday evenings, were from a consecutively numbered group of ten. These oil lamps, used to observe the eight nights of Hanukkah, were from another group of ten, also consecutively numbered. One scholar, Noting that the title of the catalog, Description des Objets de, de Art Religieux Hébraïque, or the description of Hebrew religious art objects, 
proposed that the exhibit emphasize the work's aesthetic qualities over their ritual uses as a means of humanizing the Jews and showing their similarities with other French citizens in matters of taste. But the idiomatic meaning of objet d'art is a little ambiguous and can also mean decorative objects, not works of art. And although the descriptions of individual objects distinguish one from the other with careful discussions of style, craftsmanship, and materials, each group of objects was introduced with information about how they were used in synagogue or home rituals. Frequently with the description of each subs subsequent object in a grouping would begin with the words mem usage, or same use, or mem objet. The overall approach then integrated ethnography with aesthetics. The next major display of Judaica was the Anglo-Jewish Historical Exhibition presented in London in 1887, consisting of ceremonial objects, manuscripts, books, paintings, engravings, and coins. The exhibition was designed to, and I'm quoting the organizers, illustrate English Jewish history and Jewish ecclesiastical art for two expressed purposes. First, quote, to promote a knowledge of Anglo-Jewish history to create a deeper interest in its records and relics and to aid in their preservation. Second, quoting again, to determine the extent of the materials which exist for the compilation of the history of the Jews in England. To accomplish these tasks, the exhibition's organizers pulled together nearly 3,000 works. Most from private lenders were displayed in the fairly new Royal Albert Hall. This is a contemporary photograph with the remainder from the collections of the Public Records Office, the South Kensington Museum, now known as the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the British Museum, the works all displayed at those institutions. The inclusion of ceremonial objects, referred to by the organizers as ecclesiastical art, came almost as an afterthought in order to boost the exhibition's visual appeal. As in the Paris exhibition, the display of ceremonial objects was organized by use, but now under the categories of synagogue, home, and personal. Fortunately, the London exhibition was documented with photographs that illustrate some displays. Here, too, the spice boxes are mostly displayed together, and this typological approach was repeated throughout the exhibition. However, the deep contextualization of objects to present typological displays was inconsistent and there were a few instances where related objects are presented together, if awkwardly. For example, the display of a Torah, a parchment scroll containing the first five books of the Old Testament, includes a pointer hanging on the left. In Hebrew it's referred to as a yad, meaning hand. Uh, because there's usually a hand at the terminus point. This is the pointer. And, a dec and the other object is a decorative shield. It's hanging on the right, right here. They would decorate the scroll when closed and wrapped in a cloth mantle. And I should, just as a brief digression, the reason I say awkward, because this would never, in a synagogue, you would never see a Torah like this, because the, the, the pointer would have been removed to read it. It would be off to the side, and the shield would have been placed to the side while the Torah is open. So using the, and those, those decorative posts on the top would have been removed as well. They would have been set off to the side too, because they're not uh, how one would handle them. So in a sense, it, they're used as mounts for these other objects. So that's why I say it's, it's you know, to, to a Jew's eyes, this would seem awkward. Um, but the, the, the typological approach with the pointers is pursued in other parts of the exhibit. So we see, for example, a whole group of them arranged across the top of this display alongside groupings of amulets and betrothal rings, which are what we see at the bottom of the image. The exhibition catalog reinforces the project's overarching typological organization. Within each category, lists of similar objects are introduced with brief descriptions of the object's uses in Jewish religious practices. 
The subsequent item entries provide details about each object's facture, materials, and lenders. Notably, however, there are no references to such aesthetic concerns as the historical styles of the objects or the quality of their craftsmanship. Rather, the catalog conforms to the organizer's emphasis on Jewish history and historical preservation. The typological presentation of the objects, even with scattered exceptions, and the much larger exhibition context of paintings, engravings, documents, books, etc., reinforces an impression of the ceremonial objects as a grouping, uh, as objects of Jewish religion, and as evidence of a separate aspect of Jewish life and history. The presentation of Judaica at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893 took a somewhat different turn, thanks to the dis direction and responsibilities of Cyrus Adler, an observant Jew who was also the first American to earn a doctorate in Semitic studies. After completing his degree in 1888, Adler joined the Smithsonian Institution and a year later became the curator of historic archaeology and historic religions at the National Museum. Between 1888 and 1897, he supervised the United States government's participation in four world's fairs, each hosted in, a, in an American city. The Chicago effort was the largest and most representative of the expositions. For each, Adler organized displays based to a limited extent on materials from the National Museum's holdings, which themselves were quite limited at the time. It supplemented with many more works bor borrowed or purchased from dealers or private individuals, including one especially prominent Jewish collector. After the expositions concluded, many of the objects entered the permanent collection of the National Museum. It was in this manner that Adler helped establish the anthropology department of the National Museum and museum divisions of historic religions and old world archaeology, and within them, important collections of Judaica. Adler had visited the Anglo-Jewish historical exhibition and was particularly impressed by its presentation of ceremonial objects. He proposed that what he called the Jewish plan, I don't know how he arrived at that, meaning the organization of objects according to the settings in which they were used, be followed in presenting non-Jewish religious objects exhibited at the National Museum. By the time he began arranging the religion section of the Chicago Exposition to be presented in the United States government building, Adler had concluded that describing the ritual context and uses of objects was more important than descriptions of their styles, materials, or techniques employed in their creation. However, the challenge, as Adler later noted, was, quote, whether the abstract ideas which group themselves about the word religion could be adequately or even fairly portrayed through ceremonial objects. Within the realm of religion, Adler continued, the difficulty of adequately portraying the religion of the people has been fully recognized. That of the two great divisions, creed and cult, it is cult which most readily lends itself to museum exhibition. Thus, for the Chicago Exposition, and the, unfortunately we don't have good installation photographs of them, but the, the Judaic installation was at the back of this installation, which include, included works representative of other cultures, religious materials and otherwise. <clears throat> and then we have the same in a in a uh, exhibition exposition in Tennessee, where the Judaic is at the back, and along some cases here, which are not well shown in here, uh, also in the context of other uh, world religions. In the installations, Adler utilized the techniques of comparative ethnography to illustrate the ritual practices of each one. Jewish ceremonial objects were presented with extensive labels explaining religious, 
uh, observances with which they were associated and how specifically each object was employed in them. During this period, Adler also grew into an opinion leader and activist in the East Coast Jewish community, including his hometown, Philadelphia. Just a few years after these expositions, in 1902, Adler was tapped to chair the board of trustees of the Jewish Theological Seminary, which had just been revitalized. Between 1902 and 1904, Adler also served as the seminary's de facto head while it looked for a new president. Sometime around 1904, Adler's cousin, Meyer Sulzberger, sent a number of ceremonial objects to the seminary, later writing that he donated them as, quote, a suggestion for the establishment of a Jewish museum. Sulzberger, a prominent Philadelphia judge, philanthropist, bibliophile, and Jewish community leader, had packed off the objects as part of a much larger gift of Jewish books and manuscripts. The seminary had just dedicated a new building in 1903, and Sulzberger's gifts were to augment and vastly expand the seminary's library. Subsequent accounts of Sulzberger's gifts often quote his suggestion of a museum. Much less well known is the next sentence in his letter that sets the donation's context. Quote, my hope is that the seminary may become the center for original work in the science of Judaism. That wording, the science of Judaism, refers to the Wissenschaft des Judentums. Sulzberger's reference was no accident. As a lifelong and increasingly knowledgeable Judaica collector, Sulzberger immersed himself in the history of rabbinic scholarship and its expression in manuscripts and printed texts from the earliest Hebrew incunabula to the latest publications. An enthusiastic and fairly accomplished student of what today would be called Jewish studies, he wrote a number of books and articles that reveal a predisposition towards the tenets of a higher criticism in biblical studies. Sulzberger was also a leading member of the Philadelphia group, a circle of friends and associates who established a number of benevolent and educational institutions whose values were informed by a distinct vision of American Jewry as a united community of co-religionists who shared similar intellectual, spiritual, and material needs. They helped create in America settings in which the scholarly program of the Wissenschaft des Judentums might flourish. Several journals, the Jewish Publication Society, Dropsy College, and the Jewish Theological Seminary. Despite all these activities, however, Sulzberger never explained how he thought a museum of Jewish ceremonial objects might figure in the science of Judaism. The notion that a Jewish seminary, would, whose primary purpose, after all, was training rabbis, should have a museum of ceremonial objects did not strike anyone as exceptional. By this point, the idea that Judaica might serve purposes other than ceremonial uses had become so well established that their presentation, even within the halls of a seminary, was welcomed. Sulzberger's modest gift grew into a museum of Jewish ceremonial objects by 1931, which was transformed into the Jewish Museum in 1947. In the end, the gradual reorganization of the relationships Jews had with their ceremonial objects that began in the early 19th century had crystallized by the beginning of the 20th century. The evolution of the Jewish community's growing affinity for exhibitions did not end there, however. The intellectual and emotional appeal of presenting objects in public displays persisted, whether to broaden understanding of Jewish religion and history or to secure the benefits of emancipation and acceptance in a predominantly non-Jewish society. By the 1950s, however, New York's Jewish community began steering its museum toward the display of works by non-Jewish artists, works that not only lacked visible Jewish content, but were at the cutting edge of the avant-garde at a time of dizzying change in contemporary art. The display of Jewish religious objects faded as a priority and what remained behind was an ever-widening 
Jewish interpretation of the communal benefits of exhibitions, regardless of their content. Thanks. This last work, by the way, is um, the goat with the tire around its middle on a, on a platform he is by Robert Rauschenberg. It's a work called Monogram, and uh, it's one of his most celebrated works. Uh, in, this is a little bit of extra time. When the Jewish Museum started its avant-garde program, do you, does, do, do you know the artists Jasper Johnson and Robert Rauschenberg? Are they familiar, kind of? Um, they're, they're now considered probably America's most prominent um, 20th century artists, along with maybe Jackson Pollock and Bill de Kooning. And um, the Jewish Museum gave the first solo exhibitions in a museum to both Johns and Rauschenberg, and then also presented the first solo, uh, major exhibition of minimalist art as well. So these exhibitions were quite uh, adventuresome and, uh, and somewhat controversial. So, questions or comments? Yeah. I think I have several. Let's see if we can remove all of them. Oh, good. Them down. Uh, the, the first one I was going to ask is uh, if, if, if this is part of a larger project and sort of how it fits into your, your overall um, uh, sort of intellectual and, and um, um, creative work. And also, um, if, if you know whether, because you ended up sort of in the 30s or something, sort of what happened afterwards. And sort of, I'm particularly interested if you know when sort of a, a Holocaust section would be added or integrated and how to Jewish museums and whether that changed the aesthetics of, of the whole museum. And so I mean like, because with, with Holocaust museums there's always the aesthetics of the pile that, for example, does that change? Because I, I always thought when I, when I um, saw Jewish museums and I saw these uh, objects all together that that's like, the, you know, like 20 menorahs or something that that's actually something that comes from sort of this Holocaust aesthetics of the trial, but it actually seems to be earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take your questions <coughs> Um Yes, it's part of a larger project, <coughs> excuse me, which is about the Jewish Museum of New York. Okay. <coughs> or I should say, really, it's about the, the Jewish art world of New York. Okay. <coughs> and how the Jewish Museum comes to figure into it. Um, and. Um, I'm interested in questions of acculturation and assimilation um, and how um, Jewish identity begins to shift during this period. Um, the, um, I'll just leave it at that. So I, that's the, the larger framework. And it, it, what I found is a, as I'm looking into um, the display of Jewish art or objects, however one wants to talk about it, I found myself going farther and farther back in time, and that led me to start looking at these exhibitions. And there has been a fair amount of writing, some writing about the, the exhibitions that I'm talking about, but the, but, but the pieces have all been done either by uh, historians or anthropologists uh, out of the context of museum studies, which is one of my areas of expertise. And so what I see when I'm looking at their writing is that they don't realize all of the uh, other patterns that are quite evident in these exhibitions, and the Jews are clearly looking at what's going on around them, and they're making some choices, so they're not inventing these things. It leads to one particular issue, which is quite interesting, and I'll talk, I didn't touch on it here, um, and that is the use of the word art in talking about objects, because it immediately leads to this very fraught debate about why wasn't there any great Jewish art, and why weren't there great Jewish artists, and well, it was because the Jews were always wandering, or they didn't need money, and, you know, for whatever reasons. And um, that debate it comes up um, in these various articles about those early exhibitions, which is one of the reasons why I digressed about that objet d'art um, uh, remark by, the, by, by a scholar. Um, that, that debate completely obscures the fact that the Jews themselves didn't think about it that way. I mean, it's like, it would be like, I think, talking with African tribesmen about, well, why, you're, you're, you know, these are beautiful art objects. And it's like, what? You know, or Native Americans. I mean, think about it that way. We were using it in other ways, and I think that we see still traces of that in these early exhibitions. So the, you know, the, the this discussion about Jewish art comes later, and it's an imposition of a, an ideology that really has nothing to do with the main story. Anyway, back to your question. Um, so what happens is <clears throat> the museum grows by fits and starts. 
uh, <clears throat> within the precincts of the Jewish Theological Seminary, which I should say is on the Upper West Side of New York, um, still at 123rd and Broadway, <clears throat> which is enlarged over time. <clears throat> and at one point when they enlarge it, they create a space for the museum, which is, the, which is called the Museum of Jewish Ceremonial Objects. This is 1931. And that remains so until 1947. It changes because in 1944, um, a prominent benefactor, uh, Frieda Schiff Warburg, whose husband, Felix Warburg, was a collector uh, and major philanthropist, gave the family mansion to the seminary to be used as a museum and for other purposes. And the museum is on the east side. It's on Fifth Avenue, just a few blocks up from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, it's a large and elaborate neo-Gothic uh, home uh, that could pretty readily accommodate the, the uh, growing collections of the, of the seminary's um, museum. There's a connection here, by the way, with the Holocaust. We'll get to it okay. in a moment. Um, parenthetically, the, by this point, the Jewish Theological Seminary is led by a new chancellor. His name is Louis Finkelstein. And Louis Finkelstein was very interested in um, a variety of different co kinds of programs which would help explain the Jews to a non-Jewish community. They really wanted to, uh, he really wanted to involve Jews in the discourse of American culture and politics and, 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 and social change. And they had a whole variety of programs, the most famous of which was a radio program called The Eternal Light. Um, it, 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 in turn, fostered a variety of other kinds of intercommunal, interdenominational projects. So the idea of moving the museum over to the Warburg Mansion uh, really fit in with his scheme and, 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 the, and, and the vision, I think, of several of his colleagues at the seminary and his trustees and so forth. So there was a, it was a kind of a notion of public outreach uh, enfolding uh, the idea of the museum. With regard to the Holocaust, um, Objects do start flowing out of Europe prior to the Holocaust and prior to the Second World War as communities begin to feel endangered. And the most famous collection is a collection of the Polish community, Danzig, which, which was, um, if you recall, invaded early, you know, in Anschluss, actually prior to the war. And, uh, not in Anschluss, but in, in the expansion of, of, of Nazi Germany. And so the community leaders of Danzig uh, gathered up um, collections of Judaica, somewhere in private collections, but also in synagogues, and sent it to New York with the um, provision that if the community survived, that the objects would be returned. Um, well, the community didn't survive, and the objects remained. But those objects, plus the gifts and purchases of other collections, really enlarged the Jewish Museum quite dramatically. Last. Um, how does the Holocaust change museums? Well, um, it, to an extent, it changed the, the handful of existing museums that existed, like the Jewish Museum, because they began to, um, well, for one thing, they had more objects to, 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 to show, but, but for the first time, historical preservation and memory really became a major topic. Scholars talk about it in kind of loose ways. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think in the Anglo Historical Museum exhibition story, there's, there's talk about historic preservation, so it is kind of an issue. There's a sense that at the very moment that emancipation takes place and the effects of the Enlightenment began to be felt, that already um, Jews are beginning to regard or treat or maybe even dispose of Jewish ceremonial objects. And so there's this, this tradition and, and you know, material culture that needs to be preserved. So that's there. But it's certainly not with anything like the sense of urgency that occurs after the Holocaust, or in the period leading up to and after the Holocaust. So you would see it in a place like the Jewish Museum, not because there's a separate section devoted to the Holocaust, but because of the language, the narrative, you know, that it is used to discuss the objects begins to, to shift. You see that. Um, the other big change, which I think is much more apparent, is the creation of Holocaust museums all over the country. And they vary enormously. I don't know if you know them. I mean, in some instances, they're, they're um, like the Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum in Washington, they're devoted specifically to remembrance and to what, what happened in the Holocaust, what was lost in the Holocaust, um, 
you know, just, just as telling the story as completely and vividly as possible. In other communities, there are Holocaust museums which um, t tend, to, tend to unite um, Holocaust remembrance and memorialization with the preservation and display of objects in some ways to say, this is what was lost. Um, Probably that's about as concise an answer as I could give. And then we then it gets into a whole you know, mm -hmm. issues, but yeah, it's fascinating. I have a couple mm. questions. Please. Thank you so much for this is really very thoughtful and interesting, and it's a whole history that I know nothing about. Um, just a couple comments. Mm -hmm. um, so. You're asking this question about why did the Jewish Museum support non-Jewish art in, in this period in time? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this, pre, you know, kind of assimilation and acculturation at that time period. And being from a second generation in New England where they didn't speak the language, and I can tell you by the time I was born, my father, who was raised speaking only French, Mm -hmm. um, did never sp spoke French in the house. Mm -hmm. So I think the pressure to assimilate is, you know, is probably really very strong. Mm -hmm. um, so that can't be underplayed. And the other question, or maybe comment that I have, is that in New York in the 1950s, it had become the center of the art world. So I could imagine that the people that were trying to draw attention to this museum as all good words do, would want to catch on that tale of look at how great the art that's being produced in New York is at this time period. And related to that is Clement Greenberg. He was, you know, a champion of abstract expressionism. So what, where does he fit in in terms of this museum? Because he was right there in New York, was a supporter of Rauschenberg and you know, Pollock, and so I wonder how he, you know, did he have any political machinations with the museum? Yeah, that's a, that would be a really interesting thing to look into. Yeah, well, um, uh, let me go back to the assimilation identification question and then come back to the other. Um, the, the, you have a point about um, that relationship between assimilation Identification in the, in the Jewish art world. It's, it's, it's true. It's a it's a it's a it's a kind of complicated and fraught little zone. Um, in part because, uh, well, our, I think I think the writing and theorization about identification, although you think it would be really extensive and there'd be a lot out there, it seems to me it's not actually very substantial. Um, and um, it's 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 hard for me based on that literature, or even what I've read in terms of, this is going to be an archival project, so I'm spending a lot of time looking at memos and letters and reports and things that are going back and forth as well as what's out on the print media, and really trying to trace the trajectory of different people's attitudes about these kinds of issues as best I can. Um, it's, it's pretty clear to me that the Jews who were most involved in the Jewish Museum and were instrumental in seeing it shift from a focus on Jewish ceremonial objects to showing art, and then, and, and I should say contemporary Jewish artists and Jewish ceremonial objects, and new, in, in promoting the creation of new Jewish ceremonial objects with a workshop and things like that, that those people were looking both inward and outward at the same time, so that they were very aware of what was going on in the New York art world. It's true. But as you might expect, in, in, in some ways, it comes down to personalities and tastes. Um, and this is where the critics come in. You write about Clement Greenberg being very much on the scene. He was not at all involved in the Jewish Museum. Now, it's not to say that there weren't people. Uh, Meyer Shapiro was very involved. Okay. Leo Steinberg was to a very, very limited extent. He wrote the introduction to an amazing, to the catalog for an amazing show which really launched the avant-garde program called uh, the New York School Second Generation in 1957, in which he says, in fact, I may use this for the title of my book, I'm not sure. Um, he says that this exhibition of abstract art may have, and I'm paraphrasing him now, a certain aptness, because the Jews, after all, are an abstract nation. Mm 
it was that that observation more than any others really set this project underway. Um, the other was not a, a historian so much, but a, or not so much a critic, but a historian, Richard Krautheimer, who um, <clears throat> was a friend of uh, uh, Louis Finkelstein's and instrumental in reshaping the vision of the museum into an art museum and one that might ostensibly focus on contemporary art, or modern art. Um, the, the, the New York art world was an intimately connected art, art world. I mean, art worlds are by definition small. They're regional, they're communal, everybody knows each other. Um, I, I spoke to this topic in a, in a discussion with uh, Deborah Dash Moore. Do you know her work? Mm -hmm. she's, she's a wonderful historian. She's head of the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies at, um, at the University of Michigan. And she and I did a colloquium um, in the fall uh, on the New York Jewish art world. And she made a very good observation, I thought, which was um, for the, the collectors who sort of drove the museum towards this project, why would they have done it? Why would it have been at the Jewish Museum? Because it seems odd, superficially. Because why would they be showing this work? Because they're not Jewish. There's no Jewish content. Why? It just seems like out of the blue. And um, in one of her observations, which, which is probably not far from the truth, but might be hard to document, is that, that Jewish collectors of that generation who were eager to assimilate, nonetheless, at this time, were still resisted by the art world of these places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art mm -hmm. and the Museum of Modern Art and so on. So it was kind of a... And so it might, they, they found a way to do what they wanted to do. And it may have been because, it may have been for reasons that had to do with anti-Semitism, or it may have been that they were so far out of the action that there was a difference between this younger generation of really assimilated and acculturated Jews and the previous generation which had different tastes, but were already part of the Guggenheim or the Museum of Modern Art Infrastructure, right? So there's this, you know, there's a kind of uh, fraternal battle going on in which people who, the people who made this exhibition possible, uh, Vera and Alfred Liss said, you know, a curse on your houses, we'll go off and we'll do our own thing and we'll do it at the Jewish Museum, where they had entree. <clears throat> So it, it has to do with the question, right? But it has to do with that complexity of how assimilation unfolds in ways that are unexpected. I, I, yeah, how you would tease apart which part was assimilation and which part was, you know, yeah. the social aspects of the mu museum world or what have you. Yeah, yeah very interesting. Yeah, I'll tell, I'll tell you a story that corresponds to yours. My parents are both German immigrants, and they were part of a circle of friends that they referred to as the crowd that socialized together and did everything together, so much so that all of their children, my generation, refer to ourselves as the crowd of the second generation, and we all do things, to, we all get together and do stuff together. And it was interesting to watch that crowd because there were people who flowed into American life, but kind of kept their identity with the, as Jews and, and in the crowd that, that, that showed that there was a limit to how far that process of assimilation would go. But there were two couples in that crowd who went all the way. They, they really tried to, to um, become part of what I would refer to as WASP American society. They wanted to join country clubs. One of them rode horses. Um, you know, they really tried to, you know, get into society that way. And when I think about the differences between them, I can see how in the New York Jewish community at this time, those differences, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Um, you know, played out. Fascinating. Yeah. Really yeah. Fascinating. But good, yeah, good observation. You're right on the mark. I mean, yeah, those are, those are the issues. Yeah, I'm wondering, you know, how could you do a network analysis and, you know, what would you actually kind of look at to see, you know, is that, is that interactions? I'm actually in the School of Library and Information Science, but I have, I have a master's degree in art history and American art was one of my areas, even though I was, I studied Bronze Age of G and American was something that I, I really enjoyed. And I taught art history for almost 18 years, so, so uh, yeah. But now um, I'm doing things like so social networking, and I'm, I was also interested in the way that things were organized, because that's another interest of mine, mm -hmm. of how things were organized, eth mm -hmm. eth 
ethnographically or according to kind of aesthetic arrangements or yeah, really fascinating. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I, I have a lot more to learn about that. I mean, I, I thought it was something that I knew, but I know it much, bar, much better really from the standpoint of our history than I do from the, from the perspective of, of uh, ethnography, <coughs> which is a, it's a whole you know, different world. Yeah, I don't know very much about uh, museums in terms of the way that the, hi the history of exhibition development arose. Um, I, it made me think of, there's a small uh, museum in, is it, no, it's in Montreal, it's an archaeological museum mm -hmm. that I think was like this sort of, what did you call it, it was the kind of immersive experience, mm -hmm. which is probably one of the richest museum experiences that I, I've had as an adult. Mm -hmm. And I think it must be a new kind of style of exhibition. But I can send you the name of the museum I would love it. Uh, would if you're interested. Interesting. That was like kind of, it's actually richer, I think, than a natural history, what you're thinking of in terms of natural history, because it, it looks like that is kind of diorama situation where this had like lights and sound and, you know, d human scale dioramas, and it was really wonderful. Yeah. I have, I was uh, just. Uh, I'm teaching a class right now at the Detroit Institute of Arts, <coughs> a seminar, <coughs> and I'm having members of the museum staff visit the class, <coughs> and um, we got into a conversation about um, display techniques, and he used a, a term which I've never heard before, but it, 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 it may be appropriate. He referred to it as uh, exhibition theater, and it's the use of um, you know rising and falling lights and sound and so forth in exhibitions, but normally just still objects that give them that animate them in ways, you know so. You know, this object will be lit, and you'll hear a voice, and then that light will go down, and another object will be lit, and so forth. So it kind of animates them. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. I didn't, you know, one of the things I was, had in, I mean, I'm afraid the talk would get too long, and I, one of the things I didn't talk about is that I don't think that, you know, dioramas ever had much of a, of a future, you know, in, you know, for Jewish objects, but period, a period room kind of installation absolutely would, you know, and at the Jewish Museum they did for a while have some, you know, they'd set up like the room in a home or a room in a synagogue so that you could kind of see how these objects looked in situ. And uh, so that notion, you know, was out there as an option, but they didn't pursue it until much later. <clears throat> and isn't there, it's funny, I think the last time I was in the Jewish Museum was in maybe 2001 or 2002, and there's a contemporary female artist who creates kind of immersive, environments. I cannot think of her name. She uses projected imagery and also real objects. This one I think was like crumbling. I want to say it was like a very apocalyptic. Oh, oh, oh I, was, I was thinking of somebody else. Uh, I don't, I don't know with crumbling really buildings and but with projected images and sound as well. So huh. I'll have to, I'll, I'll send that one to you too. Mm -hmm. yeah. you guys get to I know, I know. <laughs> Joan Baudouin? This is a brown bag moment. Because, uh, <laughs> well, I keep coming. <laughs> yeah, what happens um, too often is that people who sort of working in separate departments, uh, they they come to this kind of interdisciplinary setting. Oh, it's, it's, it's the most important another. thing. It's the you most see? important thing the humanities center does. You see, so, yeah, so no question about it. Even yeah. though we had a small gathering, the two people two we were from each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, this is great. Yeah. Well, welcome to the next one. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Nice to meet you.